As part of the negotiation series, this episode covers what happens when parties fail to agree an entire deal overall and instead end up getting stuck into commitments on individual details instead of the overall picture. There will be a cautionary tale and some advice on how to avoid these things from happening to you. In a particularly large and complex negotiation, it's quite standard practice for individual component parts to be broken down somewhat. Um, perhaps there'll be different constituencies on either side of the table that need to look at detail, certain committees that need to report back in terms of finance, planning, etc. Um, and, and this is quite a normal part of the process. The danger is when individual components seem to be agreed in the absence of an overall agreement. Um, for example, in the current negotiations with the UK government and its Brexit agreement with the European Union, uh, the European Union was quite insistent that Britain agree on the so-called divorce settlement before moving on to other areas. Um, it was also wanting to be quite insistent that Britain would agree to information sharing from a security point of view before addressing trade. And then even within trade, that Britain would make commitments on fisheries access before getting on to some of the other areas that it felt was important. Um, and these things can happen even at a very small scale in terms of family negotiations about uh, you know what we're going to do this weekend and so on. So um, I'm just going to go through a, a cautionary tale um, of me learning the hard way of, of how this can all go terribly wrong. Sometimes in a negotiation, one of the parties will employ the so-called salami technique or death by a thousand cuts, where they seek to have incrementally small, seemingly insignificant concessions, but stacked on top of each other one after the other. Um, this can lead to a very lopsided arrangement. Um, the other element to be aware of is that even if you believe that you have concluded the entire deal, sometimes you might not be aware that there are other things yet to come, certain surprises. So um, I'll go back to a situation many, many years ago when um, I was in the sporting goods trade and uh, we were looking to negotiate an agreement with a, a major UK retailer for our product. Now, you know, because this retailer had a fair amount of clout in the market, um, their business with us was not only important just in terms of the volume that they could sell, but also there was a fair amount of prestige. And we felt that that company having our product showcase meant that that would be a signal to some of the other competitors in the marketplace that our products indeed were worth having and it would help increase our overall sales. We were looking to break into the market, so you know, this was a price that we were perhaps willing to pay. We negotiated with a particularly experienced buyer, um, quite a, a good deal with heavy discounts from our side. Uh, but again, as mentioned, you know, we felt that that was a price worth paying, you know, to get the overall exposure and, and the kudos associated with being with this customer, you know, apart from just, you know, the sheer volume that they were going to do and, and what we would make on the deal, you know, as small as that was going to be. So the deal was concluded and we thought we had done all that was going to be done. Um, and then next we hear from the finance department um, of the same company who says, hey, great, congratulations. We've had this paperwork sent over from the purchasing department. All we now need to have from you is a commitment on extended payment terms um, or should we decide that we wish to pay early, and I believe early for them was something like 60 days, then we're looking for something in the region of about a 2 or 3% early pay settlement discount. So this would be on top of the discount that the buyer had already negotiated. So that was surprise number one. Surprise number two came from the marketing department. So this company had a catalog in these days, a paper printed catalog. And, um, you know, our product, we would have assumed, forgot to ask the right questions at the time, would be included in their catalog. So lo and behold, we get a contact from their catalog department. Um, hey, you know, we've had this passed on through the buying department, the finance department. Now it's come to us. You know, would you like to have your product in the catalog? Yes, of course we would. Oh, wonderful. Fantastic. Well, depending on how much of a page you want, how big of an image you want for the products, um, where the placement in the catalog is going to be, you're going to pay a price upon you know, this, this rack rate here. And uh, you know, it was no small sum. So by the time we sat down and looked at you know, 
how much discount we given to the customer. Um, at the time, I don't believe we did give an early settlement discount for the finance department, but they did, they did get payment terms. Um, and then we did make a contribution for the catalog. You know, we really had to scratch our heads and think, well, how much was this deal actually really worth to us? Um, and had we really asked the right questions, had I asked the right questions, early on, um, then we might have come up with a slightly different take on what our view was renegotiating the price with the buyer. But at this point, it was all too late because we'd already agreed the price. And so in the end, yes, we got the product in, so it was a win for us in that regard. Uh, but in terms of the actual financial return on the deal, it was far, far less than you would really have wanted or expected to. And, uh, you know, this was just the nature of the beast. One of the most effective ways to ensure that this sorry tale doesn't happen to you is to make sure that any proposals, concessions that you're putting on the table at the time are purely hypothetical. That we could do this. What if we offered this? Would that be acceptable to you? What would you be able to do in return? Hypothetically speaking, we could perhaps do X, Y, and Z. Provisionally, if we were to do this, what would you be able to do in return? Phrasing all of these concessions in this way just makes it really clear that you're not actually putting on the table that, oh, hey, we're offering you this discount or we're offering you this delivery schedule. Um, these are all hypotheticals. And if you're able to combine all of those into a, uh, you know, a mutually acceptable program between the two parties, then great, fantastic. Um, but if the other party isn't willing to meet you part way, if the other party isn't willing to give you the kind of concessions from their side that you're really needing, then you've lost nothing. You haven't actually committed to anything in the deal. They can't take that concession and walk away from it and hold it to you at a later time because, oh, you promised that you would do X, Y, and Z. So both verbally and in any sort of written confirmations or follow-ups, it's absolutely critical that we keep things in the purely, purely hypothetical format. I would say all sellers and really all sophisticated buyers will have their own sets of terms and conditions. And sometimes these can be at odds. Um, so it's really also important to make sure that you've had a look through not only your own terms and conditions, but those of the purchaser as well, if you happen to be on you know, the selling side of the table, because you will not be given a sale as such, you'll be given a purchase order and the purchase order will be subject to their terms and conditions for the most part if you're dealing with a major client um, and it's important that you have a really good familiarity with what they are ask questions if anything is unclear ask for explanations um, ask all the kind of questions that I should have asked all those years ago in the original negotiation with the, the customer I described um, about you know is this it are there other parties in your organization that have any indirect even impact on this negotiated settlement one way or the other. Who are those parties? When do we get involved with them? What would they be looking for? Just make sure that all of that is put out in the open up front, because if you're aware of it up front, then you can be prepared to deal with it. It's only when it comes as a surprise, as it did in my case, um, that you've really lost your shirt. And it's, it's just not something that you can recover from terribly easily. In as much as possible, it's also extremely useful to be able to future-proof your deal to the greatest extent. So what's happening here? You could have an arrangement that both parties seem to be happy with at the time because the expectation is this is an initial arrangement, this is something which will be developed further and down the road, some of those other concessions or desires that the one party is looking for for the other, they will come in the fullness of time, but for now we'll have this arrangement here just to get things started. Uh, just be very cautious of precedent, um, particularly in things like discounts or special offers, because it's quite easy for one party to um, misunderstand or deliberately misunderstand um, the idea of a one-off or limited introductory type of offer. Um, simply saying the next time around, well, that's what I had the last time. Why are you changing the goalpost? I just want the same deal that I had before. Um, and promises in the future are really not worth anything until that 
check is cashed and it may not be cashed. You have to make sure that you are satisfied with the deal as it is now and that if nothing ever happened in the future, no further deals happened, um, there was no follow on business or what have you, that you would be satisfied with this arrangement in its entirety. So having examined a number of um, important caveats to how things can go wrong, um, if you've arrived at a juncture where you are indeed very happy with the arrangement, you're totally satisfied, each party is walking away with a win-win a from their perspective, um, then you're in a position to agree the deal in its entirety. And then all that stands next is the um, affirmation of that in a, in a very, you know, legal way, even just in a casually legal way in terms of an email to a neighbor over a joint fence boundary or what have you, um, and then just making sure that that deal is, is implemented. And, and these are two topics for, for other episodes. So we'll wrap that up here and see you next time.